Today's guest is Carla C. She is an experienced media planning and buying professional with experience across the logistics, financial services, consumer goods, retail, and wholesale industry. With over 15 years of experience, she is an effective leader and team builder with the ability to collaborate and win the trust of clients and colleagues. When Carla is not developing media plans, she is an avid self-care advocate. She regularly makes time for monthly self-care Saturdays, and she also sells essential oils for Young Living after incorporating their supplements and other wellness products into her lifestyle and seeing amazing results. Carla loves to travel, try new restaurants, and enjoys a variety of workouts, including bar, spin, and kickboxing. Welcome to the show, Carla. So excited to have you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so Carla and I actually went to school together at the wonderful Elon University, and we were both uh, communications majors, and that was how we connected. So Carla, how did you get into media buying and planning? I know that's a career, a media career that a lot of people are not familiar with and may not have ever heard of before. So talk a little bit about that and how you got into it. Sure. It actually all started at Elon because when I took a communications class, then Professor Book, Connie Book, who's now the president, she had said, well, why don't you apply for the IRTS, which is the International Radio and Television Society, the minority visitation program that they had. So I actually applied for that, and it was just a weekend program, went up there, and then at that point, you could interview for the actual summer-long internship program. And I just thought, man, there's so many people here. I'm going to go on this interview. I'm going to do the best I can, hope for the best. The weekend was great. And then I guess it was maybe a month or so after that weekend workshop, they called and said I had got the internship. And I said, wow. oh, my God. I mean, I was shocked because I just, I never thought that would happen. Um, and actually, I've landed in media planning and buying then. I interned at Initiative, which is an agency in New York. And I was in their interactive or digital department. So that's how I first got my feet wet. And I think it was the Bank of America account. So technically, that was my very first account. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked there all summer and learned everything about media planning and buying. Wow. So, so what does that mean? What are you, what are you planning and buying exactly? The, the common way that I explain it to everybody or the general way is I just spend money on ads all day. So whether it's TV ads or print ads in magazines, digital ads that you see on the computer, or um, even on Hulu or connected devices and over-the-top devices, um, I, I'm just spending money on ads. So it's, it's actually a lot of fun. And it's, it's an industry I don't think people know a lot about. People know about marketing or advertising in general, but I don't mm -hmm. think everyone is always aware of the niche of media planning and buying, but I really do like it. I've been doing it now for a pretty long time, and I think it just allows you to be very creative and use both your right brain and your left brain, and mm -hmm. you can be creative, but you also have that numerical and numbers aspect of it as well. Got it. Got it. So as far as, as the, the buying aspect, are you given a budget? So it's kind of whatever the client's budget is, and then you let them know like where the spot should go. Are you selecting that or? Mm -hmm. And okay. typically it's a two phase process. So we always will know what the budget is up front. And then typically there's a period of time where we're figuring out what that overall strategy is. So say for example, they give you a $10 million budget. And there's a ton of tools and programs that you can use to figure out, okay, of this $10 million, we're going to put $3 million in TV, $3 million in magazines, um, $4 million in digital. So there, there's scenarios that you could run to say, if we do this media mix, we'll reach this percentage of our target audience. And there typically is a number where you, a goal of, we want to reach 40% of women 35, 64, four times. So there is a, a secret sauce of what that number is. Right. And that's the strategy part. And once you figure out that component, you drill down into the tactical part of it, which I love. I think that's a lot of fun too, because then you really get into the weeds of negotiations. So you go into the, the TV buying or 
the print buying with specific magazine partners. And depending on where you are, if you're on an agency or client side, sometimes it's set up where there are, it's a broadcast team. Mm -hmm. So they'll actually do those buys for you. And typically the start of my career, I was always on the planning side. Okay. So most of the things that I executed were on the print and digital side. So I always have a passion for magazines and yeah. because that's where I started. And I have very good relationships with a lot of those reps in the industry, just because I've, I've worked on print pretty much since I started. So I think that's the fun part where you can say, this is our budget. These are our clients goals. And this is what we want to accomplish. And they'll come back to you and they'll say, this is the rate. Um, for, for whatever the program is. And then you can kind of start not beating them up, but beating them up a little bit and say, I, I need this rate. I want yeah. my position to be on the back cover or the first 10% or opposite the table of content. We want to have six pages of separation from any other competitor. You can negotiate wow. all of that. And it's a lot of fun. Um, you don't have to take what they give you initially. You just keep going back until you know, it, it's a mutual understanding. You want them right. to be happy, but you want your client to be happy as well. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. So when you're watching TV shows and you see certain commercials come up, it's because there's people like you saying, hey, we need this commercial going here at this time. Or if you're exactly. flipping through, you know, Essence Magazine and you're seeing um, ads taken out, you're the person who's like, hey, we want this ad here. We want this ad in this specific location. That's exactly. amazing. That's amazing. It, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say it's um, depending on, again, where you work, there's small clients, there's large clients. Um, because you said Essence, I feel like they have a lot of Procter & Gamble brands. So say mm. you work for an agency that has a lot of P&G brands, you yeah. can, you're placing volumes of dollars with, you know, very common household brands. And it's a lot of fun. So I think, again, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's work hard, play hard. That's definitely been a motto at the old agency I worked at. And I think it, it's definitely true, but you can have a lot of fun. Wow. That's amazing. That, that is, that is a really cool industry. So, so as far as the whole negotiation process, have you ever had situations where, you know, you're kind of going back and forth with another, you know, like with a, with a, so is, I'm assuming you're going back with the rep cause you're not going back and forth with a competitor, but have you ever had an instance where they're like, no, this competitor really, really wants this spot. Like how do you win? <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessarily that you want to compete against the competitor because sometimes the competitor may just have a much bigger budget than you and you can't always right. win that way. So it's still just determining what that strategy is. I remember, um, I know I said I worked on Bank of America when I was an intern, but once I finally started my career, my first account was UPS. And I will still to this day say that was probably one of the best accounts I ever worked on. The budgets were huge. Um, it was integrated. We had a great relationship with our account management team and our creative services team. And you just really had that creativity to do a lot of what you wanted. And I remember we worked on the whiteboard campaign and I don't know if you remember it, but it was basically, there was a man who was drawing all of their services and capabilities on a whiteboard. And the person in the commercial was actually our creative director oh, <laughs> at wow. the Martin agency at the time. Um, and what we try to do is incorporate all of those services and the whiteboard piece of it into print as well. And I remember one of the things we did, it was, I believe entrepreneur magazine, we essentially, they had special sections for each content area of the publication. Mm -hmm. And we thought, okay, how can we really make an impact? I mean, you know, I don't, at the time, I don't know if our budgets were bigger than FedEx, who's obviously still one of their biggest competitors, but we wanted to bring that whiteboard campaign to life. Mm -hmm. So what I did was essentially negotiated where the first page that introduced the section, we made it a whiteboard. Wow. And we basically had the recap of what was to come in the section whiteboarded out. And that appeared six times in that magazine. So, you know, we definitely spent, but it, it, it helped bring the creative to life. And did FedEx run in that magazine? Potentially, they did run in that issue. But the impact that we had was just so profound to be able to do something like that. That's what that's the fun part of it to try to find ways that you're not necessarily always outspending or 
trying to beat your competitor from a rate perspective or mm-hmm. anything like that, but it's how can you best bring your client story to life and yeah. position that whatever their, their campaign is. That's, that's wow. really where the fun part happens. And that negotiation with the reps of this is our campaign. How can we make things easier and, and explain it and bring it to life? And they basically executed in the publication what we were trying to convey in the campaign. Wow. That's amazing. That really is, is, it sounds exciting. That is definitely an area of media that I'm not as familiar with because, you know, in public relations, that's more on the earned media Mm -hmm. side. So you're leveraging relationships with journalists and, you know, you're not paying, you're not putting dollars towards it necessarily. It's more of, you know, building relationships with the journalist to get the story. But then on the paid media side, it is, you know, actually leveraging your budget and leveraging those dollars to be able to secure specific placements for for where you want to go to get in front of your target audience so yeah that is that's really exciting I'm, I'm so glad that you that you shared that and explained that so anyone who is listening and might be interested in learning more about media planning and buying um, Carla is definitely your go-to uh, resource for that so you were talking about just when I'm thinking about some of the the, the characteristics that you need to do your job and the strengths that you need as far as negotiating and leveraging relationships and all that, that's definitely something that takes a lot of confidence building as well. And so how have you, how would you say you've developed confidence in your career? Is it something that you've always had or have you had challenges? Kind of walk us through that process. Sure. And I would say it, it takes a lot of practice because I started in the industry as an assistant planner and I didn't, have any negotiation skills. Sometimes I said, do you guys realize I'm 21 years old and you're trusting (laughs) millions of dollars of budgets? But it comes over time. Um, And I think the more you practice and the more you do it and the more you trust yourself, it it starts building. Um, and, And it definitely, it comes. And I would say it's also the relationships not always necessarily with the mentor per se. I think a lot of times when people say mentor, they that takes on more of a role than I would say just a, a coworker that's willing to lead and guide. Not always a, a mentor, but just that person that can allow you to grow, that can mm. give you enough room to say, I know you're growing, but try this. Do you know, go ahead and handle this negotiation on your own or have this call with the rep on your own and you can go back to them and they can help you. So I would say having those relationships when I started, I'm able to do that on the other side where I am now and still have people help them grow as well. Because I think the confidence comes in doing it over and over again. And it's so easy to get frustrated and feel that this didn't go how I want it, but having, I think the people around me that, that almost helped build my confidence more than me doing it on my own, because they helped me see that I could do it and help me believe myself. That's awesome. I would always say it's, I know people say it all the time, the people that are around you both personally and professionally, but Mm -hmm. professionally that helps so much because when other people are believing that you can do it, you, you, you just feel you know, I can, and I also don't want to disappoint myself or them. And that just continuously gives you the confidence to, to keep growing. Yeah, no, that's great. So as far as finding that coworker who may be, be able to kind of serve in that mentor type capacity, what are some ways or some things that, that those coworkers have done that kind of made you feel safe to even kind of enter Mm -hmm. that type of relationship? Um, it's it's tough because again I think the Martin agency is probably one of the best places I will ever work. I know I have years left in my career but just the people there um I can't say enough about all of them that I met. I felt like they were always just willing to listen and help you grow and like I said it was work hard, play hard, but you never felt that you couldn't go to anyone. And there were some that were really tough and you thought, gosh, I mean, could I have another supervisor? Could I have another director? But those are the people that, that make you grow the ones that challenge you. And I hate to say the ones that feel that they're pushing you too hard, but Mm. yeah, those are sometimes the people you do want to be around or the people that show you another way when you think your way is the right way. Um, I think sometimes when the path is too easy, you're, it, you're not really growing. 
Wow. Um, so I would say if you can find someone where you have a great relationship, but you feel challenged, that's probably going to be, be your person. I mean, I think it's great to also have that peer group where you are on the same path because you can, you can complain together, you can vent <laughs> together and that's great. You need that too. But I yeah. think in terms of growing that person that really pushes you that you might even bump heads with a little bit, those are going to be the people that help you grow. Yeah. Wow. That's so important to to make sure that you are being intentional about looking Mm -hmm. for those relationships in your, in your career that can help you grow. So I'm so glad that you, that you pointed that out as well. And one more thing I would say always, sometimes it's hard because people at a higher level, they always seem that they're very busy and they don't have time to help always ask for help. Even if it's asking them when they have time to Mm. sit with you, Make sure you, because they, they are busy, but they want you to succeed because the more you can help them, that's the less that they have to do. And, and you will be a resource for them. And when they can start to rely on you, that frees them up too, so they can grow. So I would always say, never be afraid to ask that, that the next person above you or a manager and even, even a director, um, Mm -hmm. what can I do for you? Is there anything that I can do to help? And yeah, don't ever feel that it's, you're, you're becoming a a burden or a bother, especially in the early days of your career. Um, I think that that definitely helps you grow. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. So really just, you're saying putting yourself in a position to be visible really in your your career and showing that you are available to, you know, maybe take on something additional or, you know, step in on, on a project. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, I think that's a great, um, that's a great piece of advice as well, because a lot of times, you know, we're wondering how to position ourselves for the next, next opportunity. And a lot of times it really starts before the opportunity is presented. You know, they, they're looking to see who are the people who go above and beyond, who are the people who have talents in these areas and these areas and taking on a different project may even have give you the opportunity to showcase a skill that they might not have seen before in your regular, you know, daily day-to-day work. So yeah, I think that's great advice as well. Yeah. So as far as just kind of being in this job, I'm sure it's really fast paced and <laughs> long hours and you've been doing this for several years now. So how do you unwind and de-stress? Like what is your, when you said in the introduction, we said that you do self-care Saturdays. And I, I mean, people are now are kind of, I guess it's a buzzword now, but I know you've been doing this even before. Four years. Was popular. <laughs> <laughs> so walk us through your self-care. How did you, how did you first realize you needed it? So I would say that. And then mm-hmm. what are some tips and some things that you do to, to make sure that you're taking care of yourself? Sure. I think I realized, well, I'm an introvert, first of all. So I think early on, I realized I like people. I mean, I don't mind talking and engaging and I think I'm pretty open and friendly, but it drains me. It takes a lot out of me. So I think pretty early on, I realized all of these things are great when I can spend time with coworkers or we have happy hours or get togethers and things like that. But I just need that space to unwind after. And especially at that point, when I was at on the agency side, I was working so many hours. So even, even if we had a really long day, I never wanted to feel as if I was just going to work, coming home, going to bed, waking up, hitting repeat. So yeah. even when I got home, it, it was already late, but I tried to say, okay, let me read one of these magazines that I love <laughs> that I'm placing that in, or just eat dinner or watch a show or just something to kind of unwind from the day. And that's how I would say short term during the week. But then on the weekends, I would definitely sometimes take a whole day to myself. And I would wow. say, I guess, probably a couple years ago, it was just more of a you know what, I'm just going to call this a self-care Saturday and I'm going to make the whole day for me. And I just do whatever I want. I mean, sometimes it's getting a massage. Sometimes it is cleaning because that's important too. And (laughs) I might not have time to do it. Sometimes it's reading. Sometimes it's catching up on shows. It's just taking a dedicated day to say, I'm tired and I I just need to recharge because it's been a busy week or we've had a lot of 
meetings or calls or just the day to day. I know I'm someone that that needs that personal time or quiet time to to recharge to be my best. That's awesome. So what reaction has your your friends or your family had <laughs> to the like if they're just like, you know, or do they know your phone's just like on do not disturb all day? Like how does that even work? So I think in the beginning, people are like, are, you are just so lazy. Are you really just at home relaxing? <laughs> yes, I am. I think before it was a huge self-care push. Um, that's probably how it came across. But I think, you know, as things have progressed, people are seeing the value and the benefit of taking time for you because yeah. you can go and go and go and you don't even realize the space that you need to recover. Right. Um, so I think it is shifting. The feedback has shifted as more people realize that they also need self-care. Yeah. And I know sometimes it's hard because some people are so used to constantly going. It feels like a lot to when you're like, wait, you, you just take one whole day a month and you don't do anything. It sounds, it sounds like a lot, but it doesn't have to be a whole day. It could be yeah. something very simple like what's one thing that you wish that you had time to do that you don't um and I think it, it's those little pieces and just incorporating that into your day-to-day that helps and then pretty soon you, you just develop more things and you keep you keep building it like any other skill you start yeah. and then you just keep adding and, and growing wow no that that's excellent that is that really is I think that's really important for people to realize that you do need that because I think so much so many times we think the mark of a high achiever is the person who can fit in the most and the person who can mm-hmm. adjust and make make certain changes and say, oh, well, this will only take me 20 minutes here. And then maybe this will only take me 15 minutes here. And so now I can do, you know, these 25 things in a day because they're all just this short amount of time. But even if even that, if you're not careful, can still become mm-hmm. overwhelming and you can wind up being stretched to thin far more than you even realize because you just keep saying yes, 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 yes. And yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say one thing because you mentioned that, that list of, I need to accomplish this many things in a day. Mm -hmm. I think too, I realized pretty early that I'm very, I, I think I can do way more in a day than I actually can. So sometimes it's, I need to do these 10 things but today I'm only, my goal is to accomplish three Mm. because in the trying to accomplish 10, I'm so burnt out. And then I'll realize halfway through the day, there's no way I can do all these things. So I think for me, it's just trying to, for things to be more manageable. And I would say this is both professionally and personally, because things will always come up. There's the things, the unknowns that you just had no idea would pop up that are going to detract you from the day. So rather, I don't ever you know, you don't want to end the day every day saying I didn't accomplish all the things, but I think it's in, it's being more, having a more manageable list, but then also constantly reevaluating and telling yourself it's okay. Maybe I did have, you know, I did put 10 things on the list, but kind of taking a temperature check and saying, but really the way today is going, I can only accomplish five and Mm. I'll just rejigger the five most important and do the other five tomorrow. If, if it is, that way. I think it's just being realistic and and it's okay. And I think to your point, we are such a society of overachievers. Sometimes we feel if we don't accomplish all the things we fail, but I mean, I think it's just as long as you can get to them and you set a goal for yourself, that's still success and knowing I'm human and I can't do all the things and just reshuffling to, to the, to another priority. Yes. No, that's, that's excellent. And I think it's, really about giving yourself grace and being okay doing that and not beating yourself up. And I'm not saying this, like I've mastered this. This is something I am working (laughs) on. (laughs) So in case anybody's wondering, I have not mastered this at all. Uh, But I am definitely working on what that looks like and what it feels like to give myself grace because there definitely is a, a difference between giving yourself grace and being lazy. But I Absolutely. also think that we know what that is too. And sometimes mm-hmm. you can fall for the trap of saying, oh, I'm being lazy right now. And you're not even, you're not giving that critique even from a realistic perspective. Like it's right. just this inner voice that's trying to beat you up. And it's just like, okay, if somebody else looked at all the things that you accomplished throughout this week, 
it's more than probably most people would be doing. And so for you to actually intentionally stop without being sick, without, you know, something coming up that forces you to stop, that's not wrong to do. So Mm -hmm. I think taking that is so important. And recently I've really been thinking about it more because I've been reading just a lot more resources about how important your mental health is and taking care of your mental health is and really also how your body holds stress. I've read things about people who they think they're completely fine and all of a sudden they'll have a panic attack out of nowhere. And Mm -hmm. it's because they've harbored all this stress and all of these emotions that they never slow down enough and their body is just internalizing all of it. So they're going, you know, thinking that everything is the same, everything's great, their energy's up, they can keep going. And the next thing they know, they're in the hospital because their body just says, I'm done. Exactly. And I mean, your body, if you don't voluntarily give it rest, it will make you like a panic attack. It's going to say, I am tired, I am burnt out, I am exhausted, and it'll make you rest. Um, yeah whether it's it's just a physical or emotional or some type of issue that just triggers the no we're going to rest now so i think yeah. that's very important to just to to remember that you want to voluntarily give your body the time to rest before something happens that that makes you have to stop and rest that could be even more inconvenient definitely definitely so now how has self-care Saturdays look for you since we're now in this quarantine season, you know, and we're, you know, you're not going to the office, you're at home. Did you feel like you still need to implement it or how has that looked? Yes. I know the first few weeks of the pandemic were weird because it was just more of the unknown. So work was, we were all remote, but from, from my day to day, it was a period of time in the year where we were kind of in a, um, the budgets for the previous year were done and we hadn't received budgets for the next year. So it was a weird kind of holding pattern and it seemed quiet and the day seemed really long and it, I, it, it was weird. And yeah. I think it was more mental and emotional for me because I didn't know what was, you know, what is this pandemic? What is COVID? What's going on? What's going to happen? Um, so it was more at the end of the day, I would try to take just a mental break. And even the news, it was so much from so yeah. many places coming at me. I, I even said, I know I'm probably behind on a lot that's going on, but I can't take all this information. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the beginning, it was hard, but I try to just take a pause every day. Yeah. And now work is picked up. I mean, the only thing that's different is that I'm not going to the office. And I think when you tell people, oh, well, my company, we're pretty much 100% remote at this point until we can get back to the office. They say, oh, well, you're at home every day. Um, you shouldn't need to take time for self-care. But you, it's just different. I mean, the the table I sit at, it's a little bit higher than my desk. So I find I'm kind of hunched over a little more. So it's just taking moments to, you know, roll your shoulders back and things like that. Um, I think if you're still working and you're still on, you still need to take that mental break. So I would say self-care Saturdays, they're still a part of my routine, even during the pandemic, because I think both when it started and now it's, things are feeling I mean, almost back to normal from a work perspective, because Mm -hmm. the volume of work is still there. So even though I'm not going to the office that, that nine to five, nine to six, and sometimes you you end up working a little bit later, but I still try to be very cognizant of, even though I have zero commute time, you do not need to work all hours of the day because no matter how much you work, there's still going to be stuff tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm not saying I don't ever work late, but I try to be conscious of, of a good stopping point. Still try to eat lunch. Um, sometimes I'll, the good thing I, I can work out in the morning sometimes when I do, <laughs> um, I'll work out before work. So that helps a little bit. But I think I would say, especially now in working from home, you still have to be very aware because it's very easy to get sucked into the, oh, well, I am at home, so I'll just work a couple more hours or my computer's here. Let me just log on at night and check these couple emails or 
check on a weekend. And I get there are instances where you have to, but I, I would say as much as someone can try to still keep that, that boundary that you did, even when you were going in every single day. Yeah, no, that, that is so important because sometimes you might even feel like, oh, I shouldn't need as rigid boundaries because I'm home and it's a little bit more, you know, laid back and a little bit more relaxed, but, you know, really you can wind up working more because Mm -hmm. you're not commuting. And I think it's really important to make sure that you keep those boundaries in place. Absolutely. You still need them. And even the time in front of the screen can be really fatiguing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something I found as well, because I, uh, fortunately, I am in a position where I am remote all the time anyway. But what has been more stress inducing, which I realized was having my personal and professional all coming to me Mm. on the screen. And so just the intensity of doing that, I was really underestimating it because I just said, oh, I'm just hopping on Zoom. I'm just hopping on this call. You know, it's not really that much effort, but the fatigue and strain on your eyes is, Mm -hmm. it's a lot. And if you're doing that all day, 12, 14, 16 hours, because now, you know, you're at work and then whatever extracurricular activities or volunteer or ministry, whatever it is, that's all digital too. And so you're now extending your screen time, sure. you know? So I think that, that just allowing yourself to recognize that those things are all taxing your body in some way, even if it's things you enjoy, you mm-hmm. still need to have that unplugged time as well. Absolutely. Yes. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Carla. You have just shed some amazing uh, light on just from from a professional perspective and from a personal perspective, making sure that we are taking care of ourselves. So if anyone wants to follow you and stay in touch with you, where is the best way to find you? Um, on Instagram and Facebook, it's just first name dot last name for both. Um, so usually I'm, I'm not on there often, but I'm usually just taking information and you'll probably see a lot of posts about oils because that's also (laughs) (laughs) part of my self care with essential oils and supplements, but I'm definitely up there if you want, if anyone wants to reach out. Awesome. Well, we will put your information in the show notes so people can find you. And we look forward to everything. Wish you the best with your uh, career journey. Thank you. And um, definitely will be, I will be coming to you for some additional self-care tips. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I've got plenty for you. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much. No problem. Thank you. Thank you.